Good evening, all. Distinguished dignitaries, scholars, academicians, faculty members, and students of Banaras Hindu University and other universities of India and abroad, I, Ranjana Singh, research scholar, Banaras Hindu University, welcome you all again uh, in this hall for the plenary session of the International Conference. The theme for the plenary session is Integral Humanism of the Indialupadhyay and Jack Maritan, a comparative study. To formally begin the plenary session, may I request the distinguished dignitaries to kindly come upon the dais. Dr. Ram Madhavji, Professor Chandrakala Padia, Madam, Professor Timothy Samuel Shah, and Mr. Com Carpenter D. Gordon. Thank you, dignitaries. Now, as a ritual and as a part of a culture, may I request faculty members to please come forward for the felicitation of the dignitaries by presenting Angavastram, Momento, and a bouquet. I request uh, Dr. Pradeep Kumar Parida, sir, to felicitate the chair, Dr. Ram Madhavji. <laughs> Dangavasram. And uh, the memento of Pandit Dindyalopadhyaji. Thank you, sir. I request Professor Siddharth Singh, sir, to kindly felicitate the speaker of uh, the plenary session, Professor Chandrakala Padia, madam. Professor Siddharth Singh, sir. I now request Dr. Guru Prakash Pashwan, sir, to please felicitate the speaker, Professor Timothy Samuel Shah. With a bouquet. Dhyang Vastram. and the memento. I now request Dr. Lalji Pal, sir, to please felicitate the speaker, Mr. Com Carpenter D. Gordon, sir. Thank you, sir. It is indeed an honor for me to formally welcome the respected panel for the plenary session. Dear audience, with round of applause, please welcome with me the chair for the session, Dr. Ram Madhavji. <laughs> Dr. Ram Madhavji is the president of India Foundation, a New Delhi-based think tank. Dr. Madhav has been the curator of annual global and national multilateral initiatives like Indian Ocean Conference, 
the Dharma Dhamma Conference and the ASEAN India Youth Summit. Previously, Dr. Madhav served as the National General Secretary of Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, from 2014 to 2020. I heartily welcome you, sir. Now, I would welcome the first speaker for the plenary session, Professor Chandrakala Padia, Madam. Professor Chandrakala Padia, Madam, is a retired professor of political science from Banaras Hindu University. She has served as the Vice Chancellor of Maharaja Ganga Singh University, Bikaner, Rajasthan, and as the first woman chairperson of the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies. I wholeheartedly welcome you, Madam. Along with me, please welcome the next speaker, Professor Timothy Samuel Shah, a distinguished research scholar in politi politics at uh, the University of Dallas, a Catholic liberal art university. Sir is the director of strategic initiatives for the Center for Shared Civilizational Values. Professor Shah has also coordinated a monthly online thomistic study circle. I welcome you, sir. Uh, now, may I welcome the last speaker for the plenary session, Mr. Com Carpentier de Gordon. Sir is a distinguished fellow of the India Foundation and currently the convener of the editorial board of the World Affairs Journal, a quarterly published dedic publication dedicated to international issues published by New Delhi. He is an associate of the International Institute for Social and Economic Studies, Vienna, Austria, and also uh, of Exopolitics Institute, USA. I welcome you, sir. After having f uh, formally welcome, uh, welcoming the uh, dais, may I request the chair for the session, Dr. Ram Madhavji, to kindly proceed with the session forward. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Friends, uh, without any ado, we will straight away proceed into the session uh, you know, presentations. This session is about the comparative study between Maritime and uh, the Upadchar. I just uh, read one statement. It's a quotation, it's a quote. Once the spiritual dimension of human nature is rejected, we no longer have an integral, but merely partial humanism, one which rejects a fundamental aspect of the human person. Can we differentiate between Din Dayal or Meritain in this statement. This was by Meritain. This can as well be by Din Dayal Upadhyay. So it is very important to study these two scholars. Uh, we devote this session for that exercise. As introduced, we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, each panelist may take about 15 minutes fully, but if you think it is necessary, you can take a couple of minutes more. Uh, so that we will have some time for interaction also. We'll start with uh, Madam uh, Professor Chandrakala Padiaji. Yeah, there, where? <coughs> Chair of the session, Dr. Ram Madhavji, my co-panelists, <laughs> and very distinguished faculty members as well as scholars from other universities, and my dear students. I thank Professor Dr. Abba Madhavji to invite me to this panel. The subject is very interesting. I will also not go in any formal introduction, and straight away will come to my subject. It is really surprising that how these two people one wrote a book on integral humanism in 1936. The other is a collection of essays in 1966 or 65. But both of them resemble so many things in common. And as Ram Madhavji has correctly said, I haven't found that whether ever he read Jacques Martin. I personally feel those persons who are great, great in the real sense of the term, not because they are religious or they perform several rites, not that, but who are truly and truly religious and spirited, enlightened human being. Many a times, there are many of the um, uh, principles they resemble. You know, even I was reading the Indialopadhyaji, and he was writing about Gandhi. Please do not 
keep on, uh, you know, uh, worshipping him and all that. You must follow what he said. And that will be the real Sadhanjali to Mahatma Gandhi. So all those people who think like that, you know, they all think alike in many respects. Both of them have been rooted in different traditions. And they owe it to their tradition. They ha there is no this thing that they won't say, you know. Thomas, uh, you know, I, I, I'm always very confused about the pronunciation of you said Jack, someone says Jackass, some says Meritain, some says, I was going to ask to some linguist today, what is the actual pronunciation of this Jackass Meritain? <laughs> I think. Jack Meriton, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the right Jack pronunciation. Meriton. Jack Meriton, yes. Because <coughs> the first thing which I find common in both Jack Meriton, if I'm pronouncing correctly, but please excuse me if I'm not pronouncing him correctly, and the Pandit Din Dyalopadhyay, that both of them were against anthropocentrism. They did not believe that man is the center of everything. And they were, both of them were very critical of this enlightenment tradition. This enlightened, enlightenment tradition, we said man is at the universe of thing. That has created all the problem. We became very egoist. We did not care about other living beings. And that is how slowly and gradually our ego inflated. We started working with an inflated ego, probably. And that is why you will find that both of them were against this. And if you see their definition, you know, Dindyal Upadhyay also said, man is being made up of body, mind, intellect, and the soul. But these are integrated. We cannot think of any of the part separately. The individual comprising of body, mind, intellect, and soul is not limited to singular I. I'm giving his definition to singular I, but is also su su superbly related to the plural we. There is difference between a human being and his personality. That is another thing which he said. Personality difference between a human being and his personality, what is that difference? Personality results from a cumulative effect of all the actions, thoughts, and impressions of an individual. So he made a clear distinction between human being and personality. What did Jack S. Barton said? He said, man is both an individual and a person. There is a difference between personality and individuality. See the similarity. There is a difference between per personality and individuality. The individuality of an animate and inanimate thing is rooted in matter. As far as matter has uniquely distinct determination with respect to location in space. In every material being, the prime matter, this is very beautiful, very beautifully said by him, in every material being, the prime matter bears the impress of a metaphysical energy which is called the form or soul. A man possesses a higher ontological density than the whole universe. Anything you see, Russell Button Russell, on whom my first book was there, I, I worked on him, you know, Though he was an atheist, but what did he say? He said, man is constituted of three things, instinct, mind, and spirit. And when he defines spirit, what does he say? He says, very beautifully, because you know he got Nobel Prize in literature. He says, simply the spirit means when you start thinking about others' children in the same manner in which you think about your own child. Just see. What is the definition of the spirit which he is giving? So that large heartedness, we all are blessed as human beings with that kind of spirit. Now, the second similarity which I find between them, that is both are deeply rooted in their own religious traditions. And they have 
they own it and several times they have repeated it. Din Dyal Upadhyay ji drew his inspiration from Hindu dharma. He was insistent about the view that unless stick fast and conviction to the world Hindu, the twin objectives of national integration and the emergence of an organized society will never be attained, unquote. He categorically remarked, I quote, we shall have to concede that our nationality is none other than Hindu nationality. If any outsider comes into this country, he shall have to move in step and adjust himself with Hindu nationality. But we must see what is the meaning of Hindu for these people and how he has defined Hindu. Now you see Jack Martin, he also drew his inspiration from the Christian religion. He had great faith in the principles of Christianity. For the Christian, he claims that true religion is essentially supernatural. And because it is supernatural, it is not of man, not of the world, nor of a race, nor of a nation, nor of a civilization, nor of a culture. It is of the intimate life of God. It transcends every civilization and every culture. It is strictly universal. It is strictly universal. Hence, Martin believes that if Christians want to have tranquility, they must follow Christ. They must strive wholeheartedly to realize in this world his life as a person according to the concrete ideals and truths of the gospel. He can grow and find his final consummation in the kingdom of God only. He found that Europeans who turned away from Christianity under the pressure of adverse energies came to be wholly carried along in the blind movement of a social materialism which in practice, in existence, proclaimed for that which is of it the ruin of Christian spirit. So how he also defines the uh, <coughs> Christianity, that how Christianity believes in universal values which should be followed by all the Christians. I would like to say one thing. It is easier for us to follow one's own tradition. It is very difficult to follow because we are born with that tradition. We can understand that tradition very much. Only thing is that we should not be the, we should not interpret it in a very dogmatic manner. And this will come to the third point. Both of them, they have non-dogmatic assertions for their religion. This is very important. What was a more distinguishing feature in both the thinkers was not to cling to the dogmatic interpretation of their religion. Dean Dialopadhyay raised his voice against any kind of dogmatism and rituals to be associated with dharma. He categorically mentioned, this definition is very close to that of Mahatma Gandhi. He categor, can you just a little bit of, you know, uh, AC you can on. Ar earlier, earlier it was too cold and now it has become too hot. <laughs> Two other extremes. <laughs> <coughs> he categorically mentioned that Dharma is not confined to places of worship, nor is it synonymous with religion. It is much broader and is the basis for sustaining society and the universe itself, varying in time and place, depending on circumstances and need. Dharma is a form of natural law, innate, but not theocratic. This distinction is very important, but not theocratic, the latter being the absolute rule of an individual or his supposed inviolable scripturally derived in ideas. So you see that he also was against the dogmatic assertion 
of for one's own religion. Now you see Meriton. Meriton also believed in Christianity, but he was not dogmatic about it. As you know, he was influenced both by Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. And as you find that Thomas Aquinas, we find we used to call him Arist <coughs> Christianized Aristotelian. The same thing we will find it here also. He tried to combine it with Aristotelian philosophy, emphasizing on reason. This is why in the Christian tradition, he was more influenced by Thomas Aquinas, who tried to combine the ideals of Christianity with that of Aristotle. When I used to teach Thomas Aquinas in my class, I was, I was more influenced by Thomas Aquinas than Aristotle. What was the reason behind it? Aristotle being a great philosopher, because as we say, Vedas are aparishe, because Vedas, you know, these saints and seers, they were not cognitively thinking about that, but it was the result of their own experiences and how the revelations came to them. In the same manner, when Thomas Aquinas talks of combining faith with reason, he says why faith is important, not because it is against reason. It is important because the faith which arises out of our experiences with that absolute reality, that faith will always be superior with that of reason. And that is why he was called that Christianized Aristotelian. So here we will find that he did not adhere to Christianity dogmatically, to my mind, as far as I have read him. There, are, there may be differences about him. That is why in Christian tradition, he was more influenced by Thomas Aquinas, who tried to combine the ideals, ideas of Christianity with that of Aristotle. His departure from the Christian philosophy gets manifested when he refuses to view man as a dislocated being who is wounded by the devil and bears the heritage of original sin. Contrary to that, he insisted that man is, I quote, made for supernatural end, traversed by the solicitations of actual grace, and bears within the properly divine life of certifying grace and its gifts, unquote. So in both of them, I personally feel that they were very non-dogmatic about their religious assertions. The third thing, common thing between them is that both were the staunch critique of atheism. Pandit Deen Dyal Upadhyay has deep faith in the omnipotent God who descends in human body to destroy a dharma and reestablish dharma, not to act on passing whims and fancies. The universe is sustained because God acts according to dharma. Even he says God acts according to dharma. What does <coughs> Jacques Meriton says? He also has deep faith in God who can only save man from alienation, injustice, and violence. It is he only who can save him from the clutches of distress. It is an absolute truth that man is a spark of that spirit. Those who enjoy human life as having an infinite value without the soul would necessarily fail, uh, fall into untold miseries. He alleges that his atheistic position, that man's atheistic position, would lead to political Machiavellianism. It would only manifest in an unparalleled power of totalitarian envelopment. Without the religious energies of the soul, the society will be drained of its energy. So you, you will find that both of them had strong faith in the existence of God. Both of them, the next point of convergence which you find, both were opposed to the blanket following of the West. Pandit Deen Dyal Upadhyay believed that the root cause of our problems was neglect of our national identity, where westernization has become synonymous with progress. In his words, I quote, 
in fact thoughtless imitation of the west must be scrupulously discarded unquote it would be a great error on our part to consider economic and political doctrines of the west as epitome of progress and desire to transplant the same in our own country unquote you know you cannot because every country has its own culture and its own history unless and until the ideas which come from abroad we welcome all the ideas unless they filter through our own history and culture they will, the, the same applies to the european nations also they cannot be uh, useful to us <coughs> next both are opposed to notions of nationalism which has come from the west democracy and socialism it is little surprising but what kind of democracy they are opposing that we have to see what kind of socialism they are opposing and what kind of nationalism they are opposing that is very important pandit din dayal upadhyay believed that nationalism developed in the west has resulted in merely in the extension of one's own empires beyond the european continent and subjugate other independent countries since nationalism brought nation and state together giving birth to nation states and with the decline of religious influence on politics concept of secular state arose which sust- uh, which in the name of secularism denigrated the religious spirit which sustains entire society and state we talk of secularism but in the name of secularism what we have done we have taken out the spirit of religion though it was regarded as a revolutionary concept and had made deep impact on the political life of europe ultimately it resulted in a conflict between the emerging new business community and established kings and feudal lords the new class justified its powers in the name of democracy as a result the idea of democracy which gained foothold in the minds of common man did not serve the interest of the people the individual only got a vote in the democratic setup industrial workers lost their freedom and became a slave to the wishes of business community this democracy opened the door for the emergence of marxist ideology in order to protest against this injustice karl marx came forward and felt that the root cause of their exploitation rested in the private ownership of the means of production well and good but he therefore advocated that if the means of production were made the property of the society this exploitation will come to an end the solution he sought was dictatorship of the proletariat <coughs> but the net result of this dictatorship of the proletariat was that capitalism got replaced by socialism with the same kind of exploitation and subjugation what we have seen in russia to quote pandit dindayal upadhyay i quote nationalism democracy socialism these three doctrines have dominated european social political thinking all these are good ideas they reflect the higher aspirations of mankind but by itself but by itself each of these doctrine is incomplete not only that each stand opposed to the rest in practice nationalism possessed a threat to world peace democracy and capitalism join hands to give a free rein to exploitation socialism replaced capitalism and brought with it end to democracy and individual freedom hence the west is presently faced with the task of reconciling this good ideals they have not succeeded to this day in this task and what is said by <coughs> jackas meriton in the same tone meriton also presents a critique of the western ideologies which were devoid of the content of religious spirit 
He strongly condemns the theory of economic determinism by saying that economic factors alone cannot be the source of history. It takes away the autonomy of other factors which were responsible in the creation of history. It eliminates, this is important, all transcendence in general which gives them their stability. Maritain points out to three processes of Marxist economic theory, which is very important, which give birth to three disorders in the socio-political economic setup. The first is that only economics is preponderant and makes all the forms of life. Second, it is from this material casualty that salvation would be realized by the men and would lead to the rule of reason to the elimination of man's enslavement to irrational forces, to man's victory over necessity, and to his mastery of his history. Since this kind of redemption will come through the proletariat, a class war between the bourgeois and the proletariat is imminent. Meriton claims that in all the three processes, God is absolutely missing. <coughs> Not, on, not in the name of human person, but in the name of historical dynamism of the social collectivity and collectivized man. As a result, a false social conception is imposed on man, which resulted in the formation of a collective man who is to integrate in an absolute way the individual man person and thus is deprived of his truth and freedom. Here, man becomes a victim of alienated consciousness. What we find common in both the thinkers is the fact that both felt that liberty without moral responsibility, equality without justice, industrial civilization without wisdom, happiness without end to aim at, and democracy without any task of justice and brotherly love is destined to result in chaos exploitation and totalitarianism. So each of these doctrines, they are incomplete. I just, not only that, each stand opposed to the rest in practice. Thus we discover that both Pandit Din Dayal Upadhyay and Jacques Maritain, though being rooted in diverse religious traditions, aimed at creating a socio-political order rooted in integral humanism, a humanism which regards individual comprising of body, mind, intellect, and soul. If Maritain wanted to base his integral humanism on the basic principles of love and compassion as reflected in Christian religion, Pandit Dindya Lupadhyay wanted to propound his theory of integral humanism rooted in the fourfold Pursharthas as laid down in the Hindu religion, Dharma, Arth, Kam, and Moksha. In Hindu dharma, a man is allowed to earn and satisfy his desires, but within the overarching framework of dharma, which on, would only lead to real liberation. He beautifully expresses his view by saying that the man interested with vyashti, individuality, samashti, collectivity, srishti, temporal, and parmeshti, an absolute god, is virat is truly human and great. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we had a wonderful comparative analysis of the ideas of two uh, of these prominent thinkers. Incidentally, all of them are convergent ideas. I don't know if there are any divergent ideas, whether the other two speakers will also throw light on that. Uh, but the core point that ma'am highlighted was that the contemporary European ideas were rejected by both. Uh, I mean, you are peace and conflict studies, right? Eh, Your discipline? Ah, you are teaching. You know, the mother of that subject is called Alice Boulding, the Ar Norwegian uh, American professor. She was the one who said very categorically that two-thirds of the world, these European ideas don't apply. 
being a european scholar being an american academic she was very categorical in fact her her whole thesis depends on that that don't impose these european ideas on the rest of the world because they don't apply to two thirds of the world uh, thank you ma'am for highlighting those aspects uh, tim would you go yeah namaskar good afternoon it's a great uh, pleasure privilege honor to be part of this uh, historic gathering I congratulate all the organizers. Uh, I especially want to uh, uh, greet uh, and thank uh, the Dean Dialupadia Chair here at uh, Banaras Hindu University. Congratulations, sir, on this extraordinary gathering, which is so important, not just as an academic exercise, but as an exercise in fostering what I think we all hope will be a confluence of civilizations rather than a clash of civilizations, a sangam. Uh, we might say, of civilizations uh, and values. Um, I did my doctorate in political science at Harvard uh, many years ago, more years ago than I care to admit, and uh, my advisor in uh, comparative politics was Samuel Huntington, uh, who, of course, expounded uh, the thesis uh, that uh, world politics uh, in the coming decades, uh, writing exactly 30 years ago last year, 1993 in Foreign Affairs, that world politics would be dominated by conflict and clash uh, between uh, civilizations. Uh, and uh, he believed that because uh, the forces of globalization, he argued, uh, would not in fact create uh, one uh, world family, uh, one uh, happy <laughs> family of nations and cultures. He argued that economic <laughs> globalization would actually drive uh, people to be in greater tension with each other because he essentially argued that it is a, a very human quality to hate the other. Uh, and the more we learn about the other, oftentimes the more we actually want to hate the other. <laughs> we, we disagree with them. We find that they don't share our values. And when we encounter people who don't share our values, what is our response? Our response is fear, anger, uh, hatred, uh, and his understanding of civilizations what one is, is what one might call an essentialization of civilizational differences. Uh, he tended to argue that the West uh, was, was monolithically defined by a certain set of values. Hindu civilization was defined by a certain set of values. Islam, uh, Sinic uh, civilization, Chinese civilization, etc., etc., etc. I believe this conference is um, maybe the most powerful argument that I have ever encountered against the thesis of my great uh, mentor, uh, Samuel Huntington. Uh, the existence of an amazing confluence of values which can be defined as integral humanism is a powerful refutation, I would say, of the thesis of Samuel Huntington. And so in a sense, uh, what I'd like to focus on in my brief remarks is the question of can there be a confluence rather than a clash between the integral humanism of Dean Dialupadia and the integral humanism of Jacques Maritain, as well as between the great civilizations they represent. And that, I think, is uh, something to emphasize uh, right away. The, the Gita, uh, the Bhagavad Gita in chapter 3, uh, shloka 21 says, quote, in the actions of the best men, others find their rule of action. The path that a great man follows becomes a guide to the world. Uh, I think by that standard, uh, if we define a great man based on how much others have followed in their path, I think there are few greater men of the last 100 years than Dean Dialupadia and Jacques Maritain. Uh, it is remarkable the extent to which, even though they were uh, uh, relatively quiet uh, men, of course, P Panditji, uh, Dean Dialupadia, was more a man of action than Jacques Maritain. Jacques Maritain, primarily a philosopher, he was also in many ways a man of action. Uh, he uh, fought vociferously against uh, the polarization uh, within the Catholic Church as a consequence of the Spanish Civil War. He fought against right-wing Catholics who blindly followed Franco and Franco-fascism. He uh, vociferously attacked Catholics who were anti-Semitic. 
who, who had a hatred of Jews in the 1930s. He foresaw what Hitler would do in an amazing uh, way and was active in opposing fascism. And Hitler was also equally active in opposing uh, communism. And, and yet, in, in, in many respects, as one reads them, I've, I've spent much of the last three years deeply immersed in the writing of both Jacques Maritain and Dean Dalipadia, one senses extremely philosophical minds. And I think the way uh, my friend Ramadov described these men as visionaries, as saintly visionaries, was absolutely, absolutely accurate. These are not primarily men who want to exercise power over others. These were saintly individuals who were in tune uh, with uh, the eternal laws of the universe uh, and wanted to see those laws realized for the benefit of all humanity. Not concerned primarily with the exercise of power, not concerned to acquire power for themselves, but selflessly uh, worked uh, so that their societies would flourish in accordance with uh, what uh, as I, as a Catholic, would call uh, the eternal law or natural law, and what Hindus uh, would call Santana Dharma, uh, with which I believe there's tremendous convergence. I believe there's essentially no difference, it seems to me, uh, between the Thomistic understanding of, e of the eternal law that Jacques Maritain had and a Hindu understanding of Santana Dharma. They are essentially the same. I see, I see no substantive ontological difference uh, between the eternal law uh, and uh, Santana Dharma. And both men uh, struggled, uh, fought, uh, and, and suffered also uh, in seeking selflessly to advocate that these principles would be put into practice uh, in their uh, societies. I want to just make a few brief points. The first point uh, I'd like to make, and I've already implied this, is that these two individuals were not just isolated geniuses <laughs> uh, who uh, just came out of nowhere. Uh, each of them really is a product of their civilizations. Um, in many ways, even if you could even argue that even if Dean Dialupadia had never existed, even if Jacques Maritain had never existed, I suspect you would have seen, and you already did see, the flowering of forms of integral humanism in a remarkable way that was already transforming um, uh, the West, in the case of Maritain, and uh, uh, India, uh, in the case of Dean Dayalupadia. Uh, Ram Madhavji mentioned Swami Vivekananda. You could mention many other uh, neo-Hindu revivalist thinkers uh, who were determined to adapt the, the, the deepest principles of Hinduism to the challenges of modernity, and they were already were remarkably successful uh, in doing so. Dean Dayalupadia, though, uh, his genius was to th synthesize, uh, to collect, uh, and uh, to, to, to categorize in an extremely analytical and precise way what his tradition already was teaching. Uh, he was not an isolated genius. He was a representative of his great civilization. Jacques Maritain, absolutely the same. And uh, I thank uh, Professor uh, uh, Padia for bringing this out very, very beautifully. Uh, Jacques Maritain was devoted to his Christian tradition. He was devoted to, to St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, he was famous for saying as a young man, woe to me if I do not Thomisticize. <laughs> uh, he was a disciple. He was a, he was a, a yogi of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, absolutely devoted uh, to Aquinas. As a young man, he discovered the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and for the rest of his life, he was absolutely devoted to that particular great Catholic uh, tradition. What is characteristic of the tradition of, of St. Thomas Aquinas? St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, who lived in the 13th century, was famous for his absolute devotion to the truth of the Catholic faith as taught in the scriptures, but also absolutely devoted to respecting and honoring any noble truth or idea from wherever it came which is why he avidly studied the Arab Islamic philosophers, not just Aristotle. He avidly studied the pagan uh, Greek philosophers. He spent most of his time uh, studying non-Christian thinkers because he was convinced that God's truth can come from any direction, uh, from anywhere. And so in a sense, he created a tradition that was one great dialogue. You could say a dialogical, inclusive tradition that was open to wisdom and truth 
uh, from anywhere. And when Maritain therefore became a Thomist, he was in a sense becoming an inclusivist. He was becoming a philosophical inclusivist who was precisely as a Thomist was committed to open and respectful dialogue with other points of view. And as a consequence, one remarkable fact about uh, Maritain, which I, I, I really, I, I, I think is extremely important to emphasize, Maritain was one of the first Western thinkers, maybe the first major thinker to have discovered the importance of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, in Maritain's remarkable essay, Freedom in the Modern World, he devotes pages and pages to an analysis of Mahatma Gandhi's Satyagraha uh, program and philosophy, has, a, has an entire appendix on Satyagraha, and essentially castigates his fellow Christians for not studying Gandhi uh, and studying his philosophy and his approach uh, to social action uh, and social transformation. That was the inclusivism of, uh, of Maritain, which again was not because of his own idiosyncrasies. He was reflecting uh, the great dialogical quality of the Catholic uh, Thomistic tradition. That's one point I'd like to make. Second point I'd like to make, and this is another respect in which Maritain and Dupadia were remarkably similar, is that they both were fierce critics of both the right and the left. Uh, this may come as a surprise uh, to, to, to certain people. Uh, they might think that, well, Dean Dialopadia was a man of the right, wasn't he? Um, but uh, what's clear if you read, study uh, Dean Dialopadia's writings is he is constantly criticizing both the extreme right and the extreme left. Uh, we know, and I think we're already familiar with the ways in which he's critiquing the left. And Professor Padilla again brought this out. He's, he was a strong crit critic of communism and socialism. I'm talking about Dean de Alipadia. Strong critic of collectivism, of uh, a command economy. Of course, he was criticizing Nehruvian economic policy. Uh, but he also very strongly, again and again, on almost every page, uh, is critiquing a kind of excessive conservatism. Uh, he strongly critiques what one might call a politics of order at any cost. He critiques an excessive statism. Uh, he critiques uh, the idea of a, of, of a theocracy as alien to Hindu values. He critiques Hindu sectarianism. Uh, he critiques uh, the, the Hindu Masaba, of course. So there's a, re there's a strong respect in which uh, Dean De La Padilla is trying to um, uh, define a third way between an extreme right-wing position and an extreme left-wing position. Maritain is exactly the same. Uh, Maritain was... Uh, vociferously critical of communism uh, from the time he was a young man. Even though he was raised in a milieu that was sort of favorable to the left, uh, he critiqued socialism. Uh, so he was always a strong critic of, of the left. But he also strongly critiqued the right for its indifference to the plight of the poor. Uh, he critiqued uh, efforts to join the Catholic Church to the state and impose a kind of uh, Catholic theocracy. He vociferously opposed Catholics who supported Franco in the Spanish Civil War. And for that, he was deeply attacked by many of his fellow Catholics for being disloyal to the cause of the church uh, in Spain. Uh, so uh, th this, this is really defining of both these great men, uh, that they were not party men. They wanted to transcend petty partisanship and in a way that actually cost them, uh, cost them friendships, uh, cost them influence, uh, and, but, but it was always for the sake of principle. Maritain actually describes um, um, his own position in this regard in a way that I think could apply just as well to Dean de Alipadia. Uh, and in fact, he says that what, what he really is, Maritain, is, is that he's actually, by refusing to go with the right or the left, he is a true conservative, and he defines conservative in the following way. A true conservative is a man who is reverent towards the past and yet is keenly aware of changing times and of the needs of the future. The true conservative is the greatest of innovators. He is prepared for the most radical of revolutions, for his task is to preserve the heritage of the past, a heritage which is not dead but alive. And then he goes on, 
the true conservative will decline neither to the left hand nor to the right hand. Beautiful statement. Uh, and in a sense, uh, Maritain with those lines, I think encapsulates the spirit of not only his own philosophy of integral humanism, one that is neither right nor left, but, but brings the great heritage of the past into the present. I think this description encapsulates Dean Dialopadia's position very much uh, as well. Finally, I want to just make one additional point, which is that what we are accomplishing here is too important to stay here. Um, you may remember, uh, or maybe you don't remember, uh, in the United States, uh, they used to have television ads about Las Vegas, uh, getting tourists to come to Las Vegas and do things that they do in Las Vegas, um, you know, carouse and so on and so forth. And there was a famous ad that said, uh, 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 what stays in, what, 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 what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. My hope is that what happens in this conference does not stay in this conference uh, because the uh, large movements that have been shaped on the one hand by the ideas of Dean Dalipadia and on the other hand the ideas of Jacques Maritain are in fact very large. Um, these are enormous movements. We have a billion Hindus uh, living in, in India. We have something like a billion Catholics. The, these two populations are actually ab about the same. These are enormously important movements, maybe two of the most important dynamic uh, movements, and yet we have to admit, don't we, that the relations between these movements are not very strong. Uh, they are not very positive. I would say they're by and large marked by great tension, uh, mutual distrust, uh, and I think both sides are to blame, if I'm candid. I would not put, put the blame on one side or the other, and I think many of us would agree uh, that it's not just one side or the other uh, that is, has been a source of tension uh, and problems. And I think the implications of this conference, that, there are pr that there's a profound convergence and confluence, if you go down very deep, there are superficial differences, of course, and there are also important theological differences. We, we should not kid ourselves. Uh, Catholicism and Hinduism are not the same in terms of their views of God, salvation, the destiny of human beings. But in terms of their view of human beings, in the terms of their views of how to organize the temporal order, the, the views are remarkably the same on the family, on the economy, uh, on, on rejecting an excessive individualism on rejecting also an excessive statism. There is such scope for cooperation that it would be a terrible mistake if we uh, left what we're doing at this conference and allowed it to stay in this conference. We are, I think, under a divine obligation to ensure that we take further steps uh, forward from this conference and ensure that the remarkable confluence of the philosophies of the great Dean Dialopadiaji uh, and the great Jacques Maritain, that this remarkable confluence is something we build on uh, so that millions and millions of Catholics and millions and millions of Hindus can work together on areas where they have a deep agreement with respect to integral humanism. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tim Shaw, for emphasizing on the confluence part of it between civilizations, among civilizations. Uh, since you mentioned about Samuel Huntington, <laughs> I happened to meet him in uh, just a few months before his death in 2008. Uh, you know, he, he devoted very less space to Hinduism in his Clash of Civilizations thesis. He devoted a lot of space to Islam, but very limited space to Hinduism. I asked him the reason. Probably had he given more space, probably would have talked about confluence of conflict. Uh, but the, his answer was very, very, very significant. Uh, in fact, he asked me a question, counter question. He said, uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, but uh, which authority could I go to? The biggest problem with Hinduism is, who is the authority? Uh, I mean, if I go to Puri Shankaracharya, his uh, views are different from Dwar uh, Shankaracharya of uh, Kanchi. How, who should I consider the authority? So I decided, uh, let me <laughs> go slow on Hinduism, <laughs> but whatever. Uh, 
Friends, that was a wonderful uh, presentation from uh, Dr. Tim. And now, finally, Kho, please. Dr. Ramadavji, my fellow speakers, dignitaries and friends, uh, one of uh, Maritain's uh, quotes is that uh, gratitude is the most exquisite form of courtesy. So I'd like to thank the organizers and the host for this conference. And given that uh, the previous speakers have already enlightened us about many aspects of both uh, the work of Maritain and the work of uh, Dindalia Rupadhyaya, I thought I would essentially concentrate on three aspects which are both historical and doctrinal. We said there should be no ideologies, but there are still doctrines. Uh, so uh, the first part uh, will be dedicated to the definition of humanism. The second part to uh, some aspects of Maritain's life which may not be as known and which explain uh, some of the turns he took in his uh, uh, writings and in his, uh, you might say almost, uh, his apostolate. And thirdly, uh, I will focus on the concept of human rights and the role that Maritain played vis-a-vis -vis society and vis-a-vis -vis the Catholic Church. Firstly, humanism has two well-known definitions. There is something called Renaissance humanism, which is a Western 14th, 15th century phenomenon going on to the 16th century, which um, relies on the rediscovery of ancient texts, primarily Greek and Latin, to uh, not undermine, but rather strengthen and expand the understanding of the Christian doctrine. And you find it in both Catholics and Protestants. Of course, the Protestants come later. But uh, commonly, uh, we say that uh, the Italian poet and scholar uh, Petrarca was perhaps the first humanist. However, None of those people, and there are at least 30 famous names, including uh, Lorenzo Valla and Marsilio Ficino and Lefebvre d'Etape, Erasmus, Zwingli, so on, they didn't define themselves as humanists. Uh, it was only scholars in the humanities uh, because they were essentially studying the sciences which were not related directly to God, theology. Uh, it was actually the medieval trivium, logic, rhetoric, grammar, plus poetry and lay literature, theater, whatever was, had been written by the ancients. That was what, is, what became known as humanism because of a German scholar's uh, humanismus, uh, students of the humanities, therefore humanist. However, they never had the understanding that man should be at the center. Uh, they understood that man was related to God in various ways according to whether they were more Neoplatonic or more Hermetic or more Aristotelian. Uh, I mean, some people went all the way to pantheism like Giordano Bruno or Pico della Mirandola who was a syncretist and others were more or less devoutly Catholic. But uh, that was of course a very defined form and what you find in the 19th century is a very different kind of humanism which essentially tries to replace all the attributes of a religious, which means a Christian society in the West, by uh, a society that concentrates on man's welfare and well-being and uplift. And that is, of course, a humanism of the secularists. It is a humanism of the agnostics or of the atheists. And it has a very distinct connection with Freemasonry. It has a very distinct connection with the German Aufklärung, Enlightenment. And it has a particular uh, connotation also in the Jewish context, in which a number of Jewish intellectuals decided to break away from a very stiflingly conservative Jewish tradition, which you still find in many places. You know, if you look at the Lubavitcher and the way they live, it's almost unreal. Uh, so they tried to find an equilibrium, but based on purely material considerations. And of course, this humanism had almost no knowledge of the old humanism. However, in the case of Maritain, we have a man who was astride between the two because he, on one hand, was a student of the ancient and also of the modern literature. And he, at the same time, was a thinker who wanted to be able to use reason as a, an instrument for understanding and also for managing society. 
Now, the thing about Maritain is that uh, he was born, of course, as was said before, in a Protestant society, very privileged. His grandfather had been Minister of External Affairs under Napoleon III, and then under the following republic. And he himself, uh, in the beginning, was a very much a skeptic, but then he was totally disheartened by the scientific apostasy, you might say, of his time. In other words, the fact that there was a complete, in the French society of the late 19th century, there was a very prominent trend which was Masonic and agnostic, atheistic, and also derisive about religion. And it was all about science and technology, which was going to save human beings and make them into gods. The same thing that we have now, except at that time it was a steam engine and uh, maybe the first photographing machines, the first telephones, but still very primitive for what we know now. But at that time it was considered a supreme achievement, which would, you know, some scientists were saying there is nothing more to find. We have discovered everything there was to find. So Maritain was so disheartened by that that at an early life, an early stage of his life, when he was studying at the Sorbonne at the Collège de France and had met his future wife, uh, uh, a Jewish Russian woman called Raisa Usmanov, they both made a pact that in one year, if we haven't find a, found a meaning for our life, we will commit suicide together. So this showed their complete sort of discouragement, but also their commitment to an ideal which they couldn't find. And of course, they say, story goes, that they were saved by the famous poet Charles Peggy, who was considered at that time a Catholic of the left, who told them, you should listen to Henri Bergson. And Henri Bergson taught a particular philosophy called vitalism, which essentially denied the scientific what uh, Robert Sheldrake has called the science delusion, uh, which is essentially the idea that science is, will solve all your problems. And all you have to do is study science and you'll find reason for everything. So naturally, Bergson was a major influence on uh, both Maritain and his wife. By the way, the wife played a huge role in Maritain's uh, uh, intellectual production. Both his wife and the sister of his wife who lived together with them for most of their lives. Uh, so at that point, uh, Maritain went to study in Germany, which was also a very you know, unusual thing in France because he studied at Heidelberg. He studied under Drisch, who was a, student, a teacher of biology. So Maritain had a scientific background as well. But uh, he taught vitalist biology, which was in a way resonant with Bergson's philosophy. And remember, at that time, Germany and France were bitter enemies, and uh, World War I was sort of approaching. And very few French would go to Germany because it was considered treasonous. The Germans had taken Alsace-Lorraine and they were seen as a permanent threat, you know, uh, what the Russians are supposed to be now for the West. Anyway, the fact is that uh, he went there and that shows in, his, in, in itself that he had a very independent uh, because uh, bent of mind. But that influenced him and, of course, to, not to uh, take too much in uh, you know, describing this particular aspect of his life, the fact is that a lot of his uh, ideas came out of that, uh, and he then tried to create a synthesis between the French philosophy of the time, I'm talking about the new Catholic French philosophy, and the German philosophy, but that's where, of course, atomism played a big role, because uh, Catholic French philosophy relied on what Maritain himself said, on metaphysics, as opposed to German philosophy, which since Kant had been very epistemic, epistemological. And when Maritain talks to you about certain concepts, like, for example, reason, or uh, even faith, uh, he tells you that it's not out of a set of inductions, but more about an instant feeling, which he calls core naturality, because that's the way that Thomas uh, of Aquinas describes it, but which we more commonly call intuition. So in his mind, there are certain eternal truths it's very platonic in that way, and these truths are perceived automatically by us, I mean instinctively. We may not rationalize them, we may not even want to accept them, but they are in us. And that's how he defines, of course, the role of morals, the role of religion, because God is there, he is in us, and therefore there is a point where we become aware of it. And that's why he feels that man is uh, naturally inclined to do good. That's a very controversial thing because most of history tells us the opposite. But uh, we still have to have this faith in the innate potential goodness of man if he is able to listen to his inner voice. And that led Maritain to 
develop his whole theory of how a society should enable man to express his best intuitions, and at the same time to regulate uh, through reason his uh, evil temptations or pensions. Of course, this is not very original. You know, in fact, many people have criticized Maritain in the Catholic fold by saying, listen, we have had this Catholic theology for centuries. And in particular, right since the late 18th century, France had a series of Catholic social philosophers like uh, Le Père Lacordaire or like uh, Albert de Main, who essentially pro preached a social creed that uh, uh, Catholicism or Christianity can only be achieved in society if everybody takes care of everybody, if the poor are taken care of, uplifted, and brought into um, you know, the satisfaction of their requisite needs. So in that sense, Maritain did not invent anything. And he followed the evolution of the church, because as you probably would know, the church had been extremely conservative like right until the 1830s, 40s, practically opposing any aspect of social reform, saying, you know, the order of society was given by God, kings ruled by divine law, and uh, the French Revolution and Napoleon were usurpers, and they uh, actually wrought havoc. So therefore, we have to restore the old order. This was the common message of the Catholic philosophers of the time. However, from the 1840s, 50s onwards, the church changed with Pope Leon XIII, who came a bit later. And at that point, there began to be an appeal for social Christianity. So Maritain, by entering into that current, was uh, naturally, in a way, uh, responding to the needs of the time and to the needs to respond to the leftist philosophies, but also to the right-wing tendencies, which were growing at the time, particularly in the 30s and 40s. And he had to deal with some very confusing issues. Because let's face it, somebody, some have alluded to his role, or rather his attitude, to the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and the Spanish Civil War was clearly a confrontation of ideologies, and there was no clear way to choose. Uh, you could condemn the atrocities on both sides, and God knows both of them committed them. And let's face it, the left began and committed more than the other side. But this being said, you couldn't justify, of course, what some of the rightists, or so-called rightists or royalists did. So Maritain, from a Catholic point of view, could not easily go with the Spanish Republic, which was, in fact, completely infiltrated and controlled by Stalinists and by anarchists, who were extremely violent and essentially you know, aiming to destroy traditional society. But he could not either condone what the loyalist armies did. So this being said, we understand how many different uh, conflicts uh, Maritain had to deal with, both in society and within himself. And that brings me to the third part of the talk, which is the issue of human rights. And this, to my mind, is the most controversial and the most unresolved issue that Maritain left behind him, because he played a big role in helping the church reform itself through Vatican Second Council. He became a friend of Cardinal Mancini, Montini, who then became Pope Paul VI. Paul VI was perhaps, well, he was a second progressist pope after his predecessor, uh, John XXIII. And with Paul VI, Maritain was particularly influential. The pope quoted him often and tried to introduce, or rather did introduce, a number of reforms which were considered rather abhorrent by many traditional Catholics because they tried to essentially modernize the church in the spirit of the times. And uh, that's where Maritain already introduced the notion of rights, which until then was not acceptable to the church because the concept of right was essentially rooted in God, according to the Christian doctrine. And rights could only be held in the name of God by those who had been appointed by him to rule society according to a presupposed natural order, who were, of course, the kings, and the judges and other authorities representing various, various branches of society. So the idea that everybody had rights was in itself highly controversial because it would create in man an essential, a, a, a challenger to the divine law, to the divine will. And the whole concept that somehow all people are equal and that they all have uh, rights 
however, does not allow the answer to come easily, which is, to the, to the question, which is, how many rights and how far? You know, so what we have, right from the moment you plant the notion of rights as being a God-given possession of the individual, if you want to call it God-given in the Christian ethics, then you would have to deal with the way in which these rights will be used. And it is clear that it has led to a lot of disorder. There have been some positive developments socially and economically, but there has also been enormous tension and destruction caused by the conflict between opposing rights, which cannot be easily controlled or limited because there is simply no way to do it naturally. And so I will end by saying that at that famous meeting uh, in Mexico, uh, where Maritain essentially pushed for the adoption of a universal declaration of rights, he met with a lot of resistance because people were saying, well, why should we, in the first place, make it universal when we don't know what people want in various parts of the world? And how can we implement it? This is all prescriptive, or is it just wishful? And he kept saying, let's not argue about our different doctrines and even about the justification. Let's just consider that it's natural for people to have rights. And therefore, if we follow this doctrine of intuition, we should be able to accept that everybody should be able to claim rights. Now, the question, of course, is does it mean that an authority has to be willing, able, and committed to giving their rights to people, which then means there is no need for rights, as Gandhiji said? Or does it mean that people have to stand up and fight for their rights? And then who knows what happens? So I will end here by saying that Dindarayu Padhyaya never raised this problem because it was in the framework of the Dharma which answers the legitimate needs of society and is able in a way to do what Marxism proposed, which is to each according to his needs and from each according to his abilities. So in a way, I think the dilemma that uh, Maritain tried to confront and which he was not able to solve is that he justified a society's abuse of rights potentially by not setting a more philosophical underpinning of what rights were to be and if there was indeed a need for rights or if rather we should have strengthened the concept of universal duties of all and each towards society and ultimately towards nature, which means also towards God, at least in a certain uh, metaphysical concept of the order of society and of the universe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Com, for taking us through the life experiences of uh, uh, Jack Maritain. Uh, friends, uh, all the three speakers have raised very important points. Uh, I thank the respected chair and the esteemed speakers, uh, as well as the participants for engaging in such a thought-provoking discussion. I thank uh, the paper presenters, the speakers for today's plenary session, for presenting scholarly papers for the benefit of the young scholars. With this, the plenary session is, has formally come to uh, and, uh, the end. But before that, may I request the chair, Dr. Ram Madhavji, to please present souvenirs as a token of gratitude <laughs> to all the speakers of the plenary session. <laughs> Souvenir to Professor Chandrakala Padia, madam. Uh, lastly, I have a request. Uh, please be back uh, to your uh, respective venues before 6.45 p.m., positively. Presenters uh, of the first parallel session may come back to the same hall, and those uh, in this parallel session second may proceed to the hall on the first floor. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>